tax. So let's get started. Key documents that we're going to go over today in terms of documents that can assist in minimizing claims and conflicts. Daily reports, meeting minutes, standardized forms, schedules, and photographs. Now, daily reports, one thing that a lot of people don't remember or recognize is that these are probably the most important project documents. And there's several reasons for that. These are the documents and the reports from those who are actually in the field and witness the daily activities. These reports can either support or refuse a conflict of claim, because if it's not documented, it's difficult to go back in time and prove that it existed. Now, though the following things I'm going to show you might seem obvious, I seldom see reports from contractors or even owners that contain the minimum required information that need to be that needs to be shown. That includes a listing of the equipment, manpower, and materials that was used, documentation of what work was completed and where, documentation of impacts that occurred on the project, and any relevant conversations that took place. Now, I was hired by a municipality once to fight a claim that was filed against them. And they were so sure, they told me that, hey, the dailies from the guys in our field are going to make it easy for you to be able to know what happened. Well, this is what I got. This was literally one of their daily reports. And it was, this was very similar, identical to the rest of the reports. Had no information in it. Didn't give me any idea as to what was going on. And there was nothing that I could use in defense or as an exhibit for them to defend against the claim. So what I was forced to do was rely on the contractors' daily reports. Now, at first glance, when I get these reports, I was nervous as heck because I'm thinking, oh my gosh, and thumbing through these, they've got tons of information. And it must be easy for these guys to trump whatever the city had or lock thereof. But upon further looking into it, I noticed that these guys actually set themselves up in their format that they would work for error. If you notice here, my arrow, you'll see right down here, they had every well, when you first go around, you'll see how they had everything detailed, the manpower, the work that took place. But then they actually had a box that said subcontractors. And check if the, the status or the progress of them. They checked it slow. Their subcontractor, this particular subcontractor is slow. And they also listed items in there that were bad for them. Now, that made it easy, fortunately, to be able to utilize these to show concurrent delays. There's something that, that should be done in order to be able to ensure that you're getting the information you need. And that is you need to have a standardized daily field report. This is it that has the bare minimum of the information that needs to be provided. The manpower, the equipment, issues that took place, work that was completed, conversations that took place. This is something that you should have and require that each one of these fields be filled out by the inspector or whatever field crew are doing the daily reports. And the one thing you got to remember is that it's only as good as the information that's put in there. Just like the municipality before in the previous example, well, they thought that everything was being documented. They thought for sure that their guys had a detailed account of everything that took place. But they didn't. So you have to have somebody designated that is looking over these reports and verifying that the information that must be put in there is being put in there. Don't just assume that that information is being documented. Make sure that there is some oversight and that you're getting the information that you need. Here's something that uh, I proposed, which has worked out very well. Why not have a requirement in the contract that states that the contractor must provide a daily activity report? So at the end of each day or the beginning of the following day, you get a report of the activities where he shows the equipment, rental equipment, manpower used, subcontractors on site, the work that was performed, 
and any issues that they may have found. Now, the important thing about this is if they provide that to you, then you know if there's anything documented that might become a conflict or if it did document a conflict. You've got that information ahead of time or at the time that it occurred and you can address the issue. It also gives you an opportunity to compare your report with the contractor's daily report to make sure that you're agreeing upon such things as what took place, the quantities that were completed each day, and it helps minimize the conflict because you're sharing that information and it makes it difficult if for the contractor if he's if he uh, later on the project decides he wants to file a claim, well, if he didn't have the issue documented in his daily report, how is he going to be able to come through and say, well, now I want to claim an issue that happened, but we didn't have it listed or shown in our dailies. Diaries. Several people were interested in me uh, discussing this. And I'm not a huge fan of diaries. Um, I do realize that there's a place for them. But one of the main reasons why I'm not a big fan of them is because too many people feel like they're just that, they're personal diaries. And they write down whatever they want to, um, information that should never be documented, or they ramble on and on and forget the fact that though it says diary, it's still a document which they may have to produce in a claim situation. So I, they do have a place for it, but the problem that I have is more often than not, this is what I see. This is an excerpt from a diary. 9 a.m. Trevor and I got into a very heated argument over how many density tests were being taken. He called me a blanket idiot for allowing it to happen. I told him that as the owner, we have the right to test whenever and wherever we feel needed to ensure that compaction is being met. Later on that day, says RCC hit an unmarked gas line. It isn't shown on the plants. I tried to call Evan for advice on what to do, but he was already gone for the day and didn't answer his cell. Big surprise. Well, this didn't do any help at all. All it did was document problems that they have and also documented something which isn't allowed, going back up to the testing issue. Now, I like to throw these things in whenever possible because I think it's good information and things to remember. Here's a court case that you need to keep in mind. Although the government may insist upon contract compliance with the terms of the contract, the government cannot impose a more stringent testing procedure or a standard for demonstrating compliance than is set forth in the contract. Meeting minutes. Now, having been through as many court cases and arbitrations uh, as I have, I've found that these are probably the second most important documents on a project. And there's several reasons for that. Number one, this is the one time when everyone is sat together in one room. So the issues, if there is one, can be discussed and can be addressed promptly. If a claim is not brought up in the meeting, then it doesn't exist. And this is the perfect time also for uh, the owner to ask during the meeting, are there any claim scenarios going on? Are there any conflicts or issues that we need to be made aware of that may be claim oriented? And if the contractor says no, perfect. Well, he's now locked in a deadline or a time frame in which he can't come back and try to claim something, or at least to make it extremely difficult for him to do so. Now, if it comes back and says yes, now you've got more information than you had before and you can address the issue properly and um, resolve the issue in less time and uh, having spent less money. Now, the other primary important thing here that I've kind of discussed already is that these are key documents, very key in court or in arbitration or for a jury. The reason is because they want to know when was a conflict communicated, who knew about it, how was it addressed. There's very few uh, documents can do a better job than the meeting minutes. Well, one thing you've got to remember though, just like anything else, don't document what shouldn't be documented. 
Here's an example. This is from a meeting minute that said, in conclusion, by the time construction started on this project, there was no margin for error. All contractor full time had been used during the design, plan check, and bidding phase. Therefore, so and so is aware that these type of issues occur on many projects. Well, here the owner said way too much. The person that was taking the minutes was also with the owner, documented every word of it. As a result, this ended up being a key exhibit that helped the contractor be awarded $1.2 million. Now we're going to discuss standardized forms. Standardized forms is critical for many, many reasons. First, you have a uniform method for each project related document. Okay? You have a system in place where you don't have different types of formats, designs, or anything else. You have one system in place. This limits the potential for confusion or conflict because the contractor must now follow procedure and format versus following whatever method they believe works. Examples of forms that should be standardized include RFIs, transmittals, change order requests, and notices of extras and claims. Now, for this to work effectively, though, it's best, to, and I can't emphasize this strongly enough, to have these things digitized. You need to be able to access them quickly, easily, and be able to pull up the documentation so they can be reviewed. Um, and verify that the information is correct, that the status of the project, and anything can be addressed in a prompt manner. Now, the owner should have their own standard forms created, uh, utilizing whatever documentation management system that they're using. Now, if there's something that you need help with or you don't have in place, this is something that we'd be glad to help you with. Um, let me give you an example of how this can be beneficial. Here's an actual RFI that was submitted by a contractor. Please be advised that the contract drawings in particular AS-17 lack sufficient detail. Therefore, Joe Bull requests information from the owner as to how they wish to proceed with construction of the junction structure. Please be advised that until direction is given by the owner, the contractor cannot proceed in this area and its operations are therefore being delayed. Furthermore, the inability to proceed in this area is forcing our overall operations to continue at a level of efficiency that's significantly less than what this project has been. Well, the problem here is there was no format in place. He just wrote whatever he wanted to. If he had something, and this is very simple, a standard RFI form. This could have eliminated that or at least given you more information so it was an actual RFI. If you see here in the boxes, just by requiring them to put in what spec sections is applicable, the page and the paragraph, the drawing number, and the location on the drawing sheet, along with the description. By having this type of form that they must fill out, you eliminate some of this frivolous stuff and uh, you get the information that you need and it actually comes the true RFI. Schedules. The importance of project schedules is a no-brainer. Now, however, the municipalities that I've seen don't take advantage of them. And I found the primary reasons for this is that those in charge of reviewing the schedules don't have the uh, construction uh, knowledge is the knowledge of the construction site, and therefore they don't know if the sequencing and, dura and durations are realistic or not, or they don't have the software needed to dissect the schedules, or they don't truly understand the critical value schedules have on a project, or how they can be either a great tool for all parties or a great claims tool for the contractor. As a result, the schedules often end up being submitted, but very rarely analyzed correctly. And this results in the contractor being able to document delays and claims <clears throat> and issues that don't get caught until well after they've shown it on the schedule. It's imperative for owners to have those responsible for reviewing the schedules to be trained in knowing how to review the schedules. It's also imperative that they have the standardized uh, software in 
in place. So a contractor is not pre uh, presenting a schedule in a spreadsheet on one job or in a another software on another project. There needs to be a standardized format or software that the, the owner uses and makes as a contract requirement, such as utilizing P6. Now for construction schedules <coughs> for contractors, this is even more important, but yet I continually see contractors just throwing these things together and for the sole purpose of just getting it submitted to meet a contract requirement of having it submitted, rather than utilizing as a tool for organizing and tracking the work. And it's also a tool that they fail to use in documenting the delays and impacts on the project. One thing to keep in mind, though, that the schedule, if you are going to document impacts, you've got to do it when it happens. You can't keep turning in updates and then come back later on and say, oh, we're going to plug this in here because we didn't show it. The progress schedules, if they don't show the impacts in there, it makes it very difficult, difficult to go back and try to substantiate it. Photographs. Again, the point here seems like a no-brainer. But how many of you actually have a photo diary which gives uh, pictures of the construction activities that took place each day? It's imperative that all for, uh, field personnel, from both the contractor and the owner, to carry a camera that can be downloaded into the computers. And <laughs> nothing can describe, a, <coughs> can out describe a photograph, especially photos that are taken of contested issues. A detailed photo log can assist in preventing and successfully defending against plans because it's very difficult to refute something you can see versus the written depiction of the issue. Let me give you an example of some value with some photos here. I love this one. This is a, a foreman and his crew, which were gigantic pains in the butt on a project. They claimed everything, and they made they treated everybody like crap. They were extremely difficult and contentious to deal with on the job. I kind of classify these guys as also being a special kind of stupid, because this photo was taken during their lunch break, showing them all drinking down their buds. As a result, this one photo got the foreman and those guys kicked off the project and replaced the people that were a heck of a lot more easy to deal with. What's wrong with this picture? Here the traffic control guys for the contractor are removing the delineator burials in the wrong direction. This is making this so cars are gonna or make it easy for the cars to slam to the back of them. It caused a huge safety problem. This photo resulted in the traffic control supervisor being replaced with somebody who was a tad bit more competent. Contract language that helps in minimizing claims. Now, I'm not going to have time to go into uh, detail of the complete verbiage of each one of these issues. I'm going to describe them in, in some brief detail. Uh, if you'd like to have assistance in putting these type of uh, uh, documents or sections into your contracts, let me know, and I can definitely assist you with that. Well, let's start off with the first item, mandatory pre-bid attendance. This is something that has a lot more value to it than a lot of people realize. First of all, by having a mandatory pre-bid attendance, the contractors start looking at one another, who's in the meeting. They know what their competition's going to be. As a result, they go back and they start thinking, okay, what is the other contractors, what do our, does our competition have as an edge? Is it going to be a soil uh, source, some type of material source that they have that we don't? Is there specialized equipment that they have that we don't? Is there anything that, that they have that would give them advantage over our bid? So what they do is they start sharpening their pencils even more. This results in you getting, the owners getting a reduced um, contract price. What this also does, if it's made mandatory, is that you make it known that this is the time to bring up the questions or any issues that you see in the project documents. I strongly suggest, if possible, stating that any questions or issues must be brought to the attention of the owner prior to or during the mandatory or during the pre-bid meeting. Therefore, you know all the issues and you have enough time to resolve them and get them uh, corrected prior to the bid. 
required checklist in the bid documents. Now this is something that you can use which helps strengthen uh, the enforceability of your contract. It makes it much more difficult for, an argue, for a contractor to argue if they've been impacted for something or playing outside the responsibility if they've gone through and verified the information ahead of time. Now, this checklist should include, I'll give just a, an example of some of the items. But the checklist, which should be initialed and signed in the bid form, would state something like the contractor has verified all the information in the bid documents and is satisfied that sufficient detail has been provided in order to complete the project. Another item, contractors verified that they can complete the project within the number of contract days listed. How many times do we hear about, well, you know, you had too aggressive of a schedule, there's no way we could have completed the contract in that amount of time? Well, they just stated in here that they have reviewed it, they've gone out, and they can complete the job in the time that you have it at list in the contract. Contractors verify all required materials can be accessed in a timely manner. Another issue, we always, if there's a specialty item or any other type of material that's listed, how often do we come across the contractor saying, well, we're not able to get it. That's what you required and we can't get it in time. It's causing us delay. This forces them to go through and verify that it is accessible in the time frame that will allow them to complete the project on time. Now, Another issue would be the contractor's research the project and has not witnessed has not witnessed any potential issues that could impact work. This makes it so they need to go out and make sure that they have proper access, that there's no utilities or adjacent contractors, something they can't come back with and say, well, this isn't how we did our job. We didn't recognize this. We didn't see that because they had to verify that they did do that. Frivolous RFIs. Now, how many times have we seen RFIs that were submitted because the contractor either didn't take the time to research the contract documents for the answer or submitted the RFI for an alternative reason, like to buy time or simply because they always intended to write as many RFIs as possible to create a potential issue later on? I suggest that contracts should include language that states the contractor will be held liable for the costs associated with submitting improper or frivolous RFIs. Now, the definition of a frivolous RFI is simple. It's one that is, can be answered or was answered by the information contained in the contract documents. And the contractor should also say that the cost for submitting a frivolous RFI uh, will be a stated rate of the owner so they can't come back and say we didn't know what that cost was going to be. Now, at the very least, what this is going to do is going to force the contractor to put more effort in researching all the available documentation prior to submitting an RFI. It's also going to likely lessen the number of RFIs. They're going to put more effort into it, and they might very well find the answer uh, without having to submit it. Resource loading. All projects of significant size should require that the contractor submit a resource-loaded baseline schedule. Now, several of the contracts out there do, but how often are they actually enforced? How many, if, if those of you who do have this in place, how many times have you seen the contractor actually submit a resource-loaded baseline schedule? More often than not, they didn't because it wasn't enforced. They didn't push the issue. Now, the thing I like about doing resource loading is how often do you hear, well, that's not how we bid the job? Or how often do you ask, how did you bid this job? When you have a resource loaded baseline schedule, you no longer have to ask this question because the, base, the resource loaded schedule cannot be considered as anything other than how the contractor bid the work. This helps in several different ways. First, the contractor and when he says he bid this job, he utilized less resources than they had planned. All I have to do is go back to the schedule, look at the resources, and see if that's actually what they stated. Or see what resources they showed to be able to complete the work. Another one, the contractor claims that they should have been able to complete uh, a certain piece of work at X amount of dollars per unit, but it ended up costing them more. And once again, resources in the schedule are going to tell you if this is true or not. 
Now this also helps limit the cost of change orders because you're likely going to have a list of resources they show as being able to complete necessary work that's similar to that that's in the change order. This also helps limit the potential for claims and or the cost of claims because it's difficult to claim for extra costs if a contractor utilize the same or less resources than they had than they showed to complete the work. Time and documentation requirements for notices of claims extras. Now, this is often in, in several contracts, but once again, is something that often slips by. It's vital that all the contracts contain language that gives time limits for notification. By requiring the contract to notify you in writing within a certain time frame, you limit the ability for them to come back at the end of the job and file a claim or win a claim. Now again, it's important that you have standardized forms here that require specific information. That makes it so they can't come back and say, we did notify you through some other method such as an email or other form of documentation. You have a format in place that they must fill out. If they don't file that, then they don't. They haven't provided the, the necessary uh, notification in order to uh, begin the clock checking on the claim. Another thing about this is I found that the attorneys take this very seriously. And one of the questions I'm continually asked in putting claims together is, "Hey, did we meet the notification time frame? What's the deadline for being able to submit the claim?" And if that didn't get met, it may not stop them from going ahead and, and working or, uh, you know, filing a claim, but it definitely starts to shed doubt on their ability to successfully win. Clearly defined conflict escalation procedures. Now, it's obvious that it's always everyone's advantage, to everyone's advantage to resolve the issues at the lowest level. Now, by having a required conflict escalation procedure, it's going to help increase the chance of this happening. The contract should have language that has at least three levels in this. The PM level, an intermediate level, and a final level. Again, this is just the minimum requirements. The contract should state something similar to uh, once a contractor has provided the proper notification of a conflict, the contractor's project manager and owner's project manager have X amount of working days to resolve the issue. You should go on to say if, if after X days the PMs are unable to resolve the issue, it will then be elevated to the next level where those people have X number of days to resolve it. And it goes to the top from there where if they're not able to resolve it in a designated time period, it either goes to arbitration or to a dis dispute review board or something else. Now, one thing to keep in place on these conflict escalation procedures is there are times when the parties at a certain level know ahead of time that they're not going to be able to resolve the issue amongst themselves. So there should be something in place that says that that time period can be waived at individual levels if both parties agree in writing that they are waiving it because they're unable to uh, resolve the issue at their level. dispute review boards. Now, I, I have found these to be very successful on projects that are significant size, obviously. Now, if you have a required dispute review, a review board on significant projects, it gives you several advantages. One, it helps you from staying outside of court, gives you an increased chance of being able to resolve the issue, and makes it so there's a designated process in place on how the claims or conflicts are going to be managed. Now the ZRB should consist of three people. They're chosen the same way that an arbitration panel would be. That is, the contractor picks a person, the owner picks a person, those two people, those two people pick a third person. Now the, D the uh, DRB should also have required time limits on how long they have to respond. This is going to prevent issues from being delayed further it's going to limit the cost associated with having a DRB. It's actually best to have a designated budget that the panel members must agree to. And dispute reward, uh, DRB costs are something that should be split between the contractor and the owner. 
how best to respond to problematic situations. Okay, one thing that you need to take into consideration when you're looking at these is once you receive a, a claim letter, a notice of delay, some type of an impact, recognize this. Okay, the ball is now in your court and the clock is ticking. Right? You've got to respond. As long as you hold on to that, it might increase the cost, it can get, increase the chances for them to come back and saying the delay was extended, so on and so forth. You need to take that in consideration and respond promptly. Secondly, what may seem like a silly or stupid issue may very well blow up in your face. So take it seriously. Recognize each one of those as being something that you may think is, is meaningless and worthless. They don't, and eventually it could become something that's very costly. Request a meeting whenever possible. Now, the thing here is, whenever we get these documents, we tend to get all ticked off, we want to fight, and more often than not, a letter writing campaign takes place. That doesn't do any good. Seldom are you ever going to resolve an issue by writing letters back and forth. Eventually, you're going to have to meet. So why prolong that? Once you get the document, set up a meeting, sit down, and see if the issue can be resolved. And if it can be resolved promptly. Because if you just start writing back and forth, all you're going to do is delay the issue and probably aggravate the issue because of what you stated. Face to face in meeting makes it much more easy to be able to resolve the issues. Don't take the bait, take control of the situation. You don't want to get lured into a letter war or an elevated contention. You might be mad, but it will only hurt you if you allow a fire to become a blaze. Like I said, seldom ever will a conflict be settled by letters going back and forth. So take control of the situation, meet with them, do everything that you can to get the issue resolved without having a letter writing campaign going on. Remember, Always remember, if it's not in writing, most likely or not, it does not exist. How many times have you heard that I was directed in the field to do this, or that's not what we discussed, or that's not what we agreed to? If something important is discussed verbally, whether it be in person or on the phone, it's imperative that that discussion be put in writing and sent to the person that you had the conversation with to confirm. Be sure that verbal agreements can, well, don't forget that verbal agreements can be legally binding, but when you have verbal agreements, always remember that you encounter people who can name off their girlfriend they had in second grade, but they can't even tell you what they agreed to in a conversation they had with you just a week ago. Now, I was asked by um, one of the people that's attending that as an architect or designer, how can you diplomatically get the owner to document directives that they give that may not that they may not want to be made public? In my opinion, the best way to approach this is via email. Just relay the information in the email and send it over to them, and that doesn't come across as being a public announcement. It comes across as just being a verification of what was said, and it gives you the opportunity to have a documentation trail to be able to protect yourself in case the issue arises up later. Now, if the owner isn't providing you with the information regarding directives or changes that they made, now you need to have contract language in there that protects you against it so that you can't be held liable for information that was kept from you or changes that was made to your design. Key thing you want to do, well, it's just stated in the first one, once that ball is passed to you, you want to do everything you can to pass that ball back to them. It's imperative that you get the clock stopped on your end and put the meter back on their side. Here's an example. This is an actual excerpt from a, a document that was sent by a contractor on a project I was dealing with. Please be advised that XYZ is incurring significant and unnecessary additional costs and delays as a result of John Doe's actions in the field. XYZ has been forced by Mr. Doe to perform extra work and additional testing and inspections 
for which we are entitled to additional compensation. Due to Mr. Doe's contentious, malicious actions, XYZ requests that he be removed from this project immediately. It is our position that as long as Mr. Doe is on site, our damages and delays will continue to mount. Well, that should have been something that was taken seriously and something that they, the owner should have addressed promptly. The problem is they didn't take it too seriously. They just came back and said this. ABC agree, disagrees with you and takes great exception to your allegations. Mr. Doe is performing his responsibilities as required by the contract documents and will remain on this project. ABC believes your accusations are baseless and without merit. Now, this response is not only worthless, it just it did nothing to help them at all and came back to actually haunt them. The reason being, Mr. Doe turned out to be a real jerk. He did over-exercise his authority in a manner which was well beyond the contract requirements. And as a result, the arbitration panel actually listed him by name in their award which was $6.5 million. It wasn't solely that person, but he was a great uh, contributor to it. Now, if they had taken it seriously and realized that there might be an issue there and met with them, that could have been changed. What they should have done when they received that letter from the contractor, they should have responded with something like this. ABC disagrees with your position regarding Mr. Doe. Furthermore, as you are aware, in order to substantiate any delays and related damages, you must follow the contract requirements as stated in Section 123. Until such information is provided, no consideration for delays and damages can be given. ABC suggests that a meeting be held promptly to discuss this issue. When you have prepared the required documentation to substantiate your position, please notify us of a date and time when you would like to meet. Okay, this would have been great. First of all, as you can see, it put the ball back in their court. He didn't state that you, it, you do, it gives you time to go back and see if the information was correct, if John Doe really was, as bad as they made him out to be. And now it's up to them to come back, finish the documentation as required by contract, and let you know when they are ready to meet. The clock's no longer ticking on your side. The situation. The clock's now in his court. The ball's now in his court. And time is uh, no longer a factor for you. The time is a factor for him. Here's another example. Please consider this correspondence as XYZ's formal notice of claim for all delays and damages resulting from the numerous errors and omissions found within the contract documents. Now, this is an issue that I've dealt with quite a bit lately. Well, quite a bit throughout my career. The problem is that most people don't go back and research key elements that they must get information for prior to uh, responding to them. First thing that they need to know or find out was, was prior notification given? Did they follow the contract documents? Did they allow you an opportunity to address the issue? Was there any type of information that was given prior to, or is this be just coming out of left field? Was the notification timely in accordance with the contract documents? Pretty much just covered that. But it's key, again, that there be a contract requirement, that there be a, a limited time frame in which they can do this. How many times have we been on projects where the contractor files a claim for something that happened months before, but only because they get towards the end of the job and they realize, Oh, damn, we're upside down. We're losing money. We've got to do anything we can to recoup it. So what do they do? They file a claim. If, they have the, if the contract has the notification requirements in there, it makes it very difficult for them to come back and file a claim for issues that weren't documented before. Also, this gives you an opportunity to mitigate the damages. If you don't have an, a time frame in there by which they have to respond, you're opening yourself up to an open checkbook. By having that in there, it gives you a chance to be able to fix the issue and limit the cost of your liability associated with the related conflict. Were related impacts shown in the schedule at the time they occurred? 
another no-brainer here. But if they didn't document it in the schedule, then how can they actually come back and say that it was a, a conflict or an impact occurred? These are all things that need to be considered and addressed in response to the contractor uh, whenever he files a claim issue. Is there potential merit? Don't automatically just fire off a rubber stamp saying no, you know, we disagree with everything you have. Take the time to see if there is merit to what they're saying. Again, if there is, make sure that you sit down, you meet with them, try to resolve it as fast as possible, and don't get caught up into the letter writing war. But do make sure that these prior steps or issues have been addressed. Because if they hadn't given the proper notification in a timely manner, and if these impacts weren't shown on their schedule, what do they really have to substantiate their claim? Now, what to do when nothing seems to work? There's always going to be times when no matter what you do, no matter how hard you try, the parties just aren't going around. They refuse to budge and you're getting nowhere. First thing to do is consider the fact that you might not be correct in your argument or in your position. You know, so many times we get so emotionally tied to the claim issues, regardless if we're on the owner's side or we're on the contractor's side. We're so emotionally tied to it that we prevent ourselves, we put blinders up that prevent us from seeing any validity to the other side or any fault that we might have in the issue. As a result, our hills get dug in deeper and deeper and it drags up farther and farther and the costs increase more and more on each side. You know, I was, in fact, several times I've been uh, contracted by the contractor of the owner's side where I've seen so many, so uh, much money being spent or having been spent prior to me coming aboard just because they were so emotionally tied that they could not recognize this. Just take the time to realize, okay, is there something that I'm missing? Is there something out there that could come back as being valid? Is there any potential for merit in the issue? Eliminate the problem makers. How many times have we been in situations where a conflict or claim scenario where you know, there's a chance it could get resolved, but we've got guys on either side of the table, whether it be the contractor or the owner, they're just big pains in the butt that make it impossible to try to get anything done. They're so contentious, all they want to do is argue, and there's no way in heck that they're going to budge, regardless of what is said, regardless of what is proven, and no matter what information is provided. The key thing here is eliminate those guys. Take them out of the picture. If you're not able to resolve an issue that you feel has the potential to be resolved, and this, these people are preventing that from happening, eliminate them. Go above them. Get other people in there that have the authority to negotiate the issue and see if that can work at that level. This thing happens constantly where so many issues could have been resolved if it weren't but a few people that prevented that from happening. Take into consideration how much it's going to cost to build a distance. You know, though we often want to fight, it just sometimes doesn't make very good business sense. So before you go the distance, or consider going the distance, you need to sit down, pull out a calculator, and come up with the costs that are going to likely incur if you do go the distance. That means you got to put a dollar value to each of you to yourself, an hourly rate for yourself and your staff, for the attorneys, for the experts, for the consultants, if you're going to arbitration, for the arbitration panel. And by the time you add that up, you're going to find more often than not that the costs of going the distance often aren't worth it or it's not worth the risk in case you do not prevail. And that's something that the contractor has to take into consideration also. We often forget that, okay, if we go to arbitration, what are the odds really of winning 100% of your case? 
Not very often does this happen. It has to be it's so black and white that one party was just absolutely stupid and not coming to the table earlier than that. So the odds of winning 100% prevailing slam dunk most likely not going to happen. One party is going to prevail at least a certain a certain extent. You have to take that into consideration. What's the dollar value of that? What would that cost? And by the time you get done, you're going to find that unless it's a multi multi million dollar claim, more often than not, it's not worth going the distance. It doesn't make good business sense. Now, in situations where you run into a snag, consider hiring a third party for yourself. I'm not talking about the DRB. I'm talking about you hiring an outside consultant to come in, review the situation, review your side, review the documentation, the argument on the contractor side, and have them give you an objective opinion as to the strengths and weaknesses of the position that you're taking. Now, this is a very good idea. However, you've got to be a little bit careful because you don't want to bring in some consultant that just wants to get your work and tell you what you want to hear. You've got to make sure that who you bring in is an experienced person that knows you don't care what he comes back with. What you're asking him for is his opinion, not what you want to hear. You want to hear, you want to know what somebody from the outside sees as being the probable outcome if this were to go to the distance. And what steps should be taken to eliminate that from happening? You know, a lot of people don't do that. They just set themselves up, they dig their heels in, and they miss this step. This is something that can be done relatively cheap in comparison to the cost of having to um, go the distance, bring them in, and it'll save you a bunch of money, I guarantee. Mediation. And I got to admit, if I'm representing contractors, I'm not a big fan of mediation. Reason being is, it's been my experience that if it gets to the point where mediation uh, is necessary, more often than not, the owner is so dead set, hell bent on their position, that they're most likely not going to uh, bend or change a position just because a mediator is involved. Oftentimes, when, when I'm representing contractors, I try to waive it just because I think that it's a a waste of time, a lot of times, I shouldn't say every time, but it often becomes that because it delays the issue and the outcome goes nowhere. The parties just won't agree. Now, I'm not saying that's the case every time, but there are times when you just know that mediation isn't going to work. It's going to be a waste. It's going to delay ultimate resolution. But if you feel like there is a chance, then by all means, go for it. Now, if I'm representing the owner, that's a different story. I'm all for mediation if I'm representing the owner. Reason being is because it does a couple of things that helps you. First of all, time is often on the owner's side in these situations. The longer it goes on, this may sound kind of crappy, but it's the truth. The longer it goes on, the more that the uh, probability is that the contractor is going to get worn down and they're going to come down on their claim. The other thing mediation does is it provides you information as to uh, the direction they're going. Information you might not have had prior to, so you get an idea as to, okay, if this goes the distance, what's your argument? Or you get more information about what direction and where they're going to head uh, as being their key points that they think is going to uh, help them succeed in winning a claim in court or in arbitration or other. Once again, mediation can work though. Uh, just, um, you got to make sure that if you're going to go it, go in there with an open mind, but don't waste each other's time if you're not uh, willing to listen to another person. Now when all else fails, say the hell with it. Let's go to court. I'm tired of it. Sometimes this is just inevitable. There's really no way around it. And sometimes it's necessary because you need to be able to demonstrate 
that you are willing to go the distance. You have gone through the procedures of verifying, at least in your opinion, taking every step necessary to verify that your position is accurate, and you're not about to give in. You set a precedence in showing that we will go the distance. We're not just going to cave in whenever a contractor threatens a claim or threatens a lawsuit. Top ten or top five causes of claims, in my opinion. Personality conflicts. And I addressed this a little bit in the last one, but this is by far the biggest cause of claims. Whenever I go out to a project and I'm dealing with a claim situation, my first my first question is, all right, who ticked off who? Who hates who? Because nine times out of ten, that's what it is. So guys couldn't get along. They had their egos in the way. And because of that, it made it impossible for any type of resolution to take place. Poor contract documents. As we've discussed previously, that's the second most the largest reason for claims. Documents that have not been reviewed prior to going out to bid. Again, I can't emphasize enough having constructability reviews, reviews done of your contract documents prior to advertising for bid. Spend what little money it costs to save you a fortune in the long run. Have your documents reviewed by a third party that's experienced and can go through and find the conflicts, the missing information, any details that need to be provided so the contractor can't come back and uh, issued multiple change orders and a thousand RFIs because data that was was missing that could have easily been caught had you had the review done. Inexperience. How often do we go out to a project and either be on the owner's side or the contractor's side? Let's start with the owners. A person gets assigned his job, he's in charge of it, he's the project manager, but he doesn't have the construction experience. As a result, he doesn't want to explain that or he doesn't want to, to uh, make it look like he's inexperienced and he doesn't make the right decisions or doesn't make any decisions and as a result, it just increases the chance for no resolution being able to take place and conflicts occur because they don't know how to handle it. Same thing with the, with the contractors on their side. Inadequate management and resources. This is goes to both sides. Contractor might not have enough equipment, proper uh, manpower, so that causes claims because they lose money or they fall behind and they search for ways to recoup it or to cover their end. Same thing with the with the owner side. May not have proper testing, enough people available, or they just don't have the resources to build adequately manage the job. Final reason for uh, claims. Premeditated murder, contractor planned it all along. They saw the problems in the plans. They saw a great potential for making a bunch of money on a change order or claim. They lowered their bid price because they knew they were going to recoup it in the end. They planned on it all along. Top five means of preventing claims. Develop a rapport with the contractor and the owner. I stated this before. If you've got a relationship with the contractor, with the owner, that you develop the trust factor. Spend five minutes a day with them, driving the project or just discussing the project. By the end of the first week, you know where they're from, how long they've lived here. By the end of the second week, you know how many kids they've got, what type of hobbies they have. By the end of the first month, you know what they enjoy doing, what the family's going to go on a reunion, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. This makes it pretty difficult when you develop that kind of relationship so then they all of a sudden blindside you and say, oh, by the way, a yeah, great recital last night and here's a $5 million claim that I'm um, hitting you with. It makes it so you, they want to work it out. The parties work it out a heck of a lot easier and faster. If they've got that relationship, they strive to work it out instead of being contentious. Have a thorough constructability review, just like I said, by an experienced third party. Have thorough documentation. Like we said, whoever has the best documentation is going to prevail. Make sure you've got your documentation management in place, that you have access to all information whenever you need to, and make sure that you've got everything documented that needs to be documented. 
Know virtually every aspect of the contract documents. Know the strengths and weaknesses and be proactive in resolving the conflicts. Recognize that the contract documents are never going to be perfect. That there are, whether it be contract requirements, different types of clauses that may not be all that enforceable, or areas in there that are just lacking detail or information that could become a problem. Recognize those ahead of time. Recognize issues in the field. Be proactive and find a solution prior to it becoming a problem. Don't allow your actions to become the cause. Respond quickly and make yourself available. As I always say, wear the white hat. It doesn't do any good to be the bad guy. If you always stay professional, you do everything you can and you demonstrate that you're doing everything you can to help resolve the issue, to help get the project done, and it makes it very difficult for them to come back and attack you or makes it very difficult for you to be held responsible because you've demonstrated that, you've done it in writing, and you've done it in person, that you are not a conflict-oriented person, you're a resolution-oriented person, and it was not you that created or increased the fire. Now, we're wrapping up here. I uh, strongly urge you guys to do the, the survey, please, if you would, because the information that is in there is vital to us, your feedback is, and it helps us to be able to make these webinars as beneficial for you as possible. I want to thank you guys for attending and look forward to you for the next one that's going to be coming up soon. We'll give that information out to you and I hope that you found this enjoyable. Thank you very much.